to the ever lovely Buzz Dixon. I've been asked to talk about writing for tunes, and uh, this is one of those answers that I can give you a dozen different answers for, and they would all be correct. On the, on the one hand, it's no different than writing for anything else. On the other hand, it has very specific um, genre and format requirements, technical requirements, uh, none of which are important if, you, if you're telling a story that is interesting and can be uh, easily animated. Uh, when I got started um, in animation in 78, the uh, requirement was that we be able to do what was called directing on paper. We had to call literally every single shot. We'd say close up, move in, move out, tilt up. We would tell the animators exactly how the camera was supposed to move, what was going to be seen on screen. We would describe, if, if I said a character were to run off screen, I would have to say, if I say run, then you would be able to see his legs. If I said blurred off screen, that means it would move so fast it would just be a swish. And we literally had to break everything down. So our original scripts back in the, in the 70s were twice as long as live action scripts for a similar length program. For example, if you did a, a half hour show on live, at, live television, a typical script ran about 22 to 28 pages. If you were doing an animated script that was the same length, we're talking 44 to 48 pages. So we had to, it was, it was demanding insofar as you had to call more and more shots. However, as storyboard artists began reclaiming their position in the animation industry, they began saying we want to be able to contribute more and add more and it just became more cost efficient to let them work out the specifics of the animated scenes. So gradually, animation writers began moving back into what is now uh, commonly referred to as the live action format. And so we'll write a script and it'll be the same length as if it was a live action show. You're depending upon the storyboard artist, the layout artist, to do those breakdowns, those movements, and things that we, we call for way back writing. You may know that animation writing is a fairly recent invention because up until the late 1950s, early 60s, the way the cartoons were told, even feature length cartoons were told, was by um, storyboards. And originally the storyboard artist was whatever animator wasn't working on something that week and they'd give them a big stack of cards and they'd say, okay, draw out the beats of the next cartoon, and he would draw it out like it was a comic strip, and then they would lay it out, and they would look at it and discuss it, and then they would decide who was going to animate which portion of it. And bit by bit, this became a specialty all on its own. And many animation studios would have these cork walls where they would pin up the, literally the entire cartoon. And so they would come in and they'd be able to look at it and follow it, move cards around, they throw stuff out, they change it, and then once it was done, they would assign the work to the various people. There would be a dialogue script so that the voice actors could do their, their dialogue off of that, but even then, there was room for a lot of improvisation. If you've seen the old Popeye cartoons, you'll know that Popeye, half the time, is muttering stuff under his breath. Well, that was Jack Mercer, just ad-libbing as the cartoon went on. They recognized Jack's funny enough, and nobody complains that we can't see Popeye's mouth moving, so fine, you know, just let Jack do whatever he wants to do. In the late 1950s, early 60s, as animation began moving into television, and began relying more on TV work, uh, Joe Barbera recognized they needed to make the process more standardized. They couldn't simply spend a lot of time hashing out storyboards. They needed to have a solid script that they could hand to the storyboard artist to break down. And at that point, they began hiring people specifically as writers, not as storyboard artists. There had been writers employed, but they had been typically employed as kind of a quasi uh, writer, storyboard artist, they'd come in, they, they may have an outline, the outline would get approved, and then they can start drawing pictures. So that was the origin of animation writing. Um, when you're doing animation, as I said, 
it, it has the same criteria, the same uh, necessary ingredients as any form of writing. I write short stories, I've written live action, I've written comic books. All of your stories need to focus on what is the most important thing to at least one of the characters in the story. And ideally every story is about the most important event in at least one of those characters' lives. Now I realize when you're doing stuff like be it SpongeBob SquarePants or Tiny Toons or any franchise show, it's a little difficult to make every story the most important story for somebody. But it, it does have to carry a certain amount of weight and importance to it. When I was started in animation, we were constantly being pointed to um, Super Friends as a good type of show. That's the kind of show kids like, do shows like that. And I was really disappointed with Super Friends. Uh, the people who worked on it were all very, very competent, very good at what they did. But my critique was, you know, if the Joker steals the Eiffel Tower, Batman doesn't miss a meal. Batman doesn't go hungry because the Eiffel Tower is missing. Nobody goes hungry because the Eiffel Tower is missing. It's just some weird crime the Joker has committed. And there's no real motive for him to commit the crime. There's no real impetus for Batman to want to solve the crime. And I was, I kept pushing, we've got to make the stories about something. When I finally had a chance to do that, there was a show called Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, I was given a chance to write one, and I said, well, I want to do something different. I just don't want to do a standard, uh, you know, adventure type story like the, the Thundar stories we had been doing. I'm, I'm very happy and very proud of my work on Thundar, but it was also a very traditional barbarian fantasy adventure show. A barbarian shows up, encounters bad guy, fights bad guy, brings victory in the end. And if, if Thundar wasn't, didn't have a personal stake in it, he just inserted himself anyway. Oh, we cannot let this go. You know, right, Ariel. You know, off they go and have the adventure. I wanted to do something with Dungeons and Dragons that carried a little more weight. And there was a class of villain in the D&D mythology. It was called a skeleton warrior. And I thought, well, what would a skeleton warrior want? What would he desire? Well, obviously, to get his body back. You know, nobody wants to be a skeleton warrior. So I did a story where the protagonists encounter a skeleton warrior, and the skeleton warrior has been told by the chief villain in the story, if you will defeat them, if you beat them, I will give you what you want. I will, I will restore your body to you. And so now we had a villain who actually had a motive that, that is understandable and is also something you can't really argue against. You, you know, well, what's, what's wrong with wanting to have your body restored to you? That's something I would want if, you know, I had been turned into a skeleton warrior. And so for the first time, they let me do a story that had this kind of conflict in it. And the result was that we got a lot of very positive feedback on that. A lot of people have told me that it was their favorite episode. When I went on to work on G.I. Joe and Transformers and shows like that, I always tried to make the episode about something really important to at least one of the characters. Uh, the two-parter I did for G.I. Joe, the traitor, I, I had a character, Dusty, who is a member of the Joe team, but his mother was suffering from a chronic illness. She needed medical attention. He could not, his military pay and his military insurance would not cover her, and he was desperate to find some way of paying for her medical bills. And Cobra basically approaches him and says, well, hey, you know, if you'll just let us know where G.I. Joe is going to be so we can avoid him, you know, we won't, we won't use the information badly. We won't hurt anybody. Just, just tell us where they're going to be so we can be somewhere else. Well, kids at home are going, well, I might actually do that if my mom was yeah. sick. If, if my mom was, you know, really suffering and somebody offered me that deal, I, I might actually take that deal. And it was, it was a, a really good show to work on, and I was very happy with it. Um, and we kept the audience in suspense, because as a two-parter, it ended 
with you thinking he did sell out, he did betray the Joes, and that uh, he had gone over to the other side. Since, you know, at the end of it, of course, he, it turns out it was all part of a master plan to uh, undermine Cobra, and he had been doing this under the direction of the, the, Joe, the Joe Command. But for, you know, for a 24-hour period, we had a lot of kids convinced <laughs> that one of the Joes had turned traitor. And that, to me, was always the important thing in the story. You have to have something that is of vital importance to a character. When you have something silly like Roadrunner and Coyote, Coyote's going to starve, Roadrunner wants to live. That's a very basic, primal thing. Though by the time, you've got to ask yourself, if he can afford all this stuff from acting, why doesn't he just buy himself a yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> same thing. What's his job? <laughs> yeah. Um, Tweety and Sylvester, same thing. Uh, you you can look at these shows and, and these classic cartoons, and when they're very simple like that, they're they're easy to relate to. One of my favorites is the Bugs Bunny spoof on Little Red Riding Hood that was done during the World War II era. And Little Red Riding Hood is this obnoxious Bobby Soxer, and at the end of it, she has just bugged Bugs Bunny so badly that even though he's got the wolf on the verge of destruction, he goes, you know, I can't help it. And he frees the wolf and he puts her in the, the peril at the end. Yeah. And you go, yeah, she's obnoxious. I, I agree with you, Bugs. The wolf you can deal with any time, but her, yeah, you know, get her. You can get away with stuff like this on shorter cartoons. When you're doing longer cartoons, particularly when you're trying to tell a consistent worldview, you have to work with in that context. Um, certain shows, I'm going to call them family shows, because they are less about the adventures or what the family does as they are about how the family relates. There, you've, you've got to work with how does this relationship work depending upon what a person needs it? Simpsons is a good example of that. You know Bart is always going to be the fly in the ointment. If, if everybody else says up, Bart will say down. If everybody else says left, Bart will say right. You also know that Homer is his own worst enemy. He's just not capable of figuring out how dumb he is. And as a result, he will plunge headlong into things but he at least has a decent heart. He may get outraged and, and angry at Bart on occasion, but in the end, Homer always does the right thing about his family. Uh, another show like this that I don't know if you watch, but you should, uh, The Venture Brothers, which started out, The Venture Brothers started out as this parody, kind of mashup parody of the Hardy Boys and Johnny Quest, and it has become one of the most complex, in a good sense, shows that anybody has done. Because it, it looks into the very stereotypical issue of good versus evil, but it looks at it as if good and evil have been quantified to the point where there are bureaucracies supporting both sides. And there's actual negotiations between the good and the evil sides as to, well, how do you attack one another? What are the rules? You know, you just can't charge up and attack somebody. You've got to You've got to formally announce, I'm your arch, your arch villain. I'm going to be the person attacking you. And you have to have a formal method of approaching them. You just can't jump on them anytime you feel like it. And the, and the show is hilarious because of that, because they're taking these ridiculous extremes and they're making them very normal. And because of that, you get the humor off of it. But again, the interesting thing about it is how do these characters react emotionally to all of this? And what, to me, has always been the, the winning point of it is, is that Dr. Venture, the father figure in this, is a very weak character in terms of his own personal strength of character. In the end, when, when everything comes down to the final wire, in the end, however begrudgingly, he'll make the right choice. You know, but he's, you're always wondering about it. But in the end, he makes the right choice. This is what I always approach when, you, when I'm thinking of a story, what is the most important thing to somebody. But when it comes down to the technical breakdowns of the story, 
again, you have to approach it by format. If I'm doing a half hour adventure show, I know, okay, I've got three acts, and at the end of each act, I've got to have some kind of a cliffhanger that my audience will want to come back and see, well, does, does Optimus Prime get out of this? Does, uh, you know, does Duke manage to escape? I have to figure out some action point to end on to bring the audience back. So that makes plotting an action show pretty easy. You just say, okay, well, we, we start out with situation normal, and then all of a sudden something bad happens, and then when the bad thing happens, we've got to correct it, but the first thing that happens makes it worse, and so now they've got to fix the thing that made it worse, but uh-oh, it's gotten even worse now, so now we've got a really bad problem, and then at the end, uh, we somehow pull a rabbit out of our hat, and we, we end it, and we win, and everybody's happy. Um, and you can get to that place from any number of starting points. Steve Gerber, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Howard the Duck, but Steve Gerber created Howard the Duck, and he also was an animation writer. And he was the original story editor on G.I. Joe. I worked under him, I was the assistant on the first season. And we were sitting around at lunch one day, the whole Sunbow crew, and he was, you know, we were, we were kidding around, he was joking, and he said, I've got an idea for a G.I. Joe story. He said, he got a phone call from the Viper. And the Viper says, I'm coming to bite. I'm the Viper, I'm coming, you know. And every time the Viper calls, there's another cryptic message from the Viper. And the Joes get really anxious about this. They're convinced that Cobra's got some plan, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. And in the end, the Viper is this little old man. I'm the Viper. I'm here to bite the windows. And, uh, <laughs> and we heard this at lunch, and we all laughed. It's a funny joke. Okay, this was on a Tuesday. Friday, Steve needs a script delivered no later than Monday morning. All of a sudden, the Viper joke looks really good. <laughs> And that was, one of, that was one of our, our most favorite episodes. People yeah. remember that one a lot. It started out as a joke, but son of a gun, you know, at, at uh, 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, you've got nothing else. The Viper looks good. Yeah. Um, when you're doing stories like this, when you're trying, you, you try to think of what that entry point is. What is going to catch the audience's attention? You don't have a lot of time to build up interest. With a movie, you can start kind of slow because, hey, they, they've paid their money, they're in the theater, they're not going anywhere for a few minutes at least. But unfortunately, thanks to television, now if you don't catch people's attention, even if it's a theatrical film, eh, they get bored and they're out of the way. That's why the Bond movies always open with something that has yeah. virtually nothing to do with the rest of the movie. It's just, okay, here's your action, you got it, okay, good. Now, let us start building the story slowly at this point. That's their style. They can get away with that. Typically, you have a, a, an action movie. The bad guy starts something right away. Oh, no, how are we going to solve this? Then you introduce the hero, and gradually you show who the hero is, and gradually the hero gets involved, and then once he's involved, all the problems start. When you're writing television, if it's not an action adventure show, if we were like when we were doing Jim, you have to think, well, what will be the challenge point here? One of the Jim episodes that I wrote involved an imposter trying to undermine Jim by basically going out and acting, you know, really terrible in public as Jim and getting people to turn against her. And so that was an easy way to get the show started. You just show the character acting obnoxious because you know the fans are going to go, well, that's not, that's not Jim. That's not who she is. And then you bring the real Jim in, and then the real Jim has to basically solve the mystery of herself. Why, why does everybody think I'm such a terrible person? And she has to break down what's going on and figure out who this person is and track down the imposter and expose her. That was one way to get involved in that. Another way, and I had been asked earlier about um, the, the oddest script that I ever wrote, and this is odd in every sense of the word, I did a Tiny Toons episode called uh, C-flat or B-sharp. Now that's the official title 
because they bungled it. The official title was, the title that I wrote was C sharp or B flat. Get the pun there, that makes a joke. C sharp or B flat. They switched it around for reasons known only to them. And the pitch for this cartoon was, I went into Paul Dini's office and I said, the tiny tunes have to deliver a piano to the tune of the Hungarian Rhapsody. And he said, write that up, you've sold it. So I go home and I think, well, how in the world am I going to write this up? Because you have to have the action matching the music. This was when the old storyboard artists would be able to do this. They would just listen to the music and they would draw the gags to the music and pin it up on the board. So what I did was I bought a copy, an LP of the Hungarian Rhapsody. That's how long ago this was. <laughs> <laughs> I bought an I bought LP of the Hungarian Rhapsody. And I played it not at 33 and a third RPMs, but at 45 RPMs because if I played it at 33 and a third, it would be too long for a, for a segment. Yeah. 45 RPMs it would fit just barely. I play it at 45 RPM, and as it's playing, I narrate over the music what is happening during each point. So I'd be going like, falling, the bookcases are falling, and they go over, 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 and I'm just right. chanting along with the music so the animators would know the pacing of the gags. They took that tape recording, it's never written up. They took the tape recording, they gave it to the animators, and the animators just played it and listened to it, and they animated according to it. Then they gave the music to the um, uh, music department, who cursed me roundly, and then they had to figure out how to play the music at the equivalent of 45 RPM. <laughs> so they played, they sped the music up quite a bit to play it. Um, I got paid for it, and it got my name on it as the writer, but I never wrote a single word for that. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> How else could you do it, though, really? I mean, you know? Precisely. The, without the, the storyboard artist. Without, with, without being the storyboard artist, the only way to, for a writer to do that would be to narrate it over the music. Yeah. And there are times when, not particular to animation writing, you will be handed a piece of footage that has already been accomplished, like a, a documentary, news footage, sometimes even a foreign film that has to be dubbed into English, and uh, you're asked to you know, supply dialogue to this. And before they had what is now called ADR, or automatic dialogue replacement, where they can digitally change the mouth movements, when Japanese cartoons were imported to the United States, like the original Astro Boy or Speed Racer, the characters are speaking in Japanese. And first off, the Japanese were not as fanatical about lip movements matching as the Americans were. The mouths would just open and close, and that was it. And in Japanese, it very often takes longer to say something than an American would say it equivalently in English. And so you would end up with these shows like Speed Racer where characters would say, I must win the race by going fast, because only by going fast will I win the race. You cannot win the race unless you go fast. In the original Japanese, it's a sentence that makes sense and sounds yeah. like something a Japanese person would say. In English, you have to just keep filling that out flatten and they would keep you know, putting stuff in there. And you end up with really bizarre things sometimes. You have people making radical changes on stories because they, they either get an editorial fiat from above. Uh, these characters are not lesbians. They are cousins. <laughs> they like each other. Same or move. They're exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so you have to insert things and explain away things that are, are not in the original material, and you have to figure out something that covers that and lets you get away with it. Uh, it's all technical stuff, and you get different companies will have different requirements. Uh, you, will, you will sometimes work very closely with the art department. You will other times be very deliberately isolated from the art department. When I was working at Ruby Spears on Thundar the Barbarian and other shows, I made it a point of making friends with the storyboard department because these were the guys that were going to be translating my work on the screen. And if I knew what their strengths and limitations were, they in turn um, they would get scripts from me that would be easier for them to do. 
And conversely, if they had ideas and things that I would not have thought of, they could suggest to me and I could incorporate them in the scripts. Uh, I'll probably be telling this story again tomorrow, so if you hear it again tomorrow, I apologize. But there was a show that I worked on for 15 minutes called uh, Turbo Team. <laughs> and uh, Turbo Team was, was Joe Ruby's answer to the Transformers. It was about a teenage boy who turned into a car. Yeah. Um, I'll say why I only worked on it for 15 <laughs> minutes tomorrow. <laughs> um, but basically what happened was I, I, knew, I was friends with the Ruby Spears Story Department, and they moved the Ruby Spears Story Department from the main studio building to a new building, which coincidentally happened to be Cheech and Chong's old offices. And I, I got to tell you, never was there a more appropriate place to put the Ruby Spears storyboard department than <laughs> Cheech and Chong's old offices. So um, I was friends with John Dorman, who was the head of the storyboard department, and John and I were going to have lunch. And I go over to meet John for lunch, and I walk in, and they're all just sitting there, glaring. And I thought, oh, brother, they've had an argument. They're fighting with each other, and they're feuding. And I stood there for 90 seconds in total silence while these guys were just glaring. And I know it was 90 seconds because they had the radio on, and we went through three commercials before anybody said anything. And finally, John Dorman said, and I will clean this up, since there are tiny ears in the audience. Appreciate that. <laughs> John Dorman says, gosh darn Joe Blow, who's another writer. And they all started pounding their tables. Gosh darn him, gosh darn him. What had happened was this guy had written a script for Turbo Team, where Turbo Team, as a car, climbs up on a diving board, the swimming pool, high dive diving board, the swimming pool, as a car. Yeah. And he jumps up and down on the diving board as a car. Then he executes a jackknife, <laughs> splashes into the water, and swims over to a rowboat in a swimming pool as a car, and climbs in as a car. <laughs> and they were supposed to figure out how to draw this. <laughs> you understand why they're pounding their desk and yelling, gosh darn Joe Blow, gosh darn Joe Blow. You know? Classic. Um, yeah, this, this also relates to why I was on the show for only 15 minutes. I was, I was asking those kinds of questions before they went downstairs. Um, you end up with, with editorial fiats like that that you just have to work around. You, you're, you're told um, Lone Ranger, for instance. I did not work on the Lone Ranger show, but I got my start at Filmation Studios. And they told the artist, the Lone Ranger can't carry a gun. Well, wait a second, the silver bullet is like an important, crucial part of his story. Well, he can carry the gun, but he can't shoot it. Well, what's the point of him having the gun? Well, he can shoot at rocks, okay? So, <laughs> so basically, every, every other episode, he would start an avalanche to prevent something from happening. Like if there was a stampede, he would shoot a boulder and cause an avalanche. Um, I had a friend, uh, still have a friend, Michael Reeves, who was working on the live-action ISIS show at that time. And Michael Reeves sold a lot of scripts to them because he figured out ISIS could make things not happen, and that gave them like a virtually unlimited budget because ISIS could say, damn, don't burst. And the damn doesn't burst, and so she's just, you know, <laughs> she's just stopped the damn from bursting. Bridge, don't collapse. And the bridge doesn't collapse. You know, they loved him for that. It's like, oh, Michael, please come and make as many things not happen as you possibly can. Save our budget. You you end up with these various editorial fiats. Uh, we worked under in the early '70s and early '80s. We worked under tremendous pressure from the networks not to have violence in the shows. Yeah. And we would be told, uh, you know, trim stuff back. The Thundar show was was the was a very popular show. It won its time slot when it was on the first season. But ABC came back and said, um, the show is too violent. We're going to cut the violence down for the second season. And Joe Ruby recognized, well, you know, 
pretty much the only thing selling this show is the violence. So <laughs> how are we going to get around that? And I said, well, what we've got to do is we've got to write a season opener that is so violent, even though they cut it down, that still leave enough stuff in it that we can imitate that in future episodes. And if they ever challenge us, we say, well, hey, you let us do it in the season opener. So Joe said, well, who can we get to write such a violent episode? And every eye in the room turned to me. <laughs> so I wrote this episode called Wizard War. And Steve Gerber, who was a story editor at Ruby Spears before he went to Sunbow, Steve complimented me. He said, you're the only person I know who can write a 45-page fight scene without fighting, repeating himself once. And I, I basically did what I described earlier. Thundar, aerial and nuclear, right over a hill. They see a big wizard war going on. We must stop this. And that's it. They're into the story, and they're just creating mayhem. And I had... One wizard is using robots, and another wizard is using uh, uh, mud golems or something like that. So they're not living creatures, and I could I could do all kinds. Of, I could smash them flat. I could drop them ducted fans, and the parts go flying everywhere. And even Joe Ruby looked at it and turned green and said, "My God, we can't give this to the network." And he edited it before it went to the network. And the network went absolutely ballistic, and they struck out a lot of stuff. But they ended up leaving enough in for us to be able to have an action-filled episode. And after that, we were able to use that as our defense. You know, well, you told us we could do it in this episode. The ironic thing is that for 17 years after that, I was the official bad example at NBC Standards and Practices. <laughs> Whenever they would hire a new censor to come in, and they would give him a copy of my script, and if he couldn't find at least 50 things wrong with it, he didn't get the job. <laughs> so you get, you get different editorial fiats by people, and sometimes you're told we, we have We've used this character too often. Don't don't use it for a few episodes. Um, with GI Joe, we would be given instructions. Here's here's the vehicles we want to use in the next episode, and so you'd have to write a story that would incorporate those vehicles. And sometimes it produced interesting stories because if you got a list that included a a jungle vehicle and a uh, submersible and an Arctic vehicle. Well, now you've got to come up with a story that would logically include all three of those vehicles. Uh, after a while, though, the people at Sunbow and at Hasbro rather realized these guys will use everything in the toolbox. We don't have to tell them to do anything. We'll just, just have them write the scripts and they'll, they'll use it. The one example of this that didn't work as well as it could have was the G.I. Joe movie where we were asked to introduce brand new characters into the Joe team. And the problem with that was when people want to go see a movie based on a TV show, they want to see the characters from the show in a movie. They don't want to go to a movie that introduces brand new characters. And Hasbro recognized this belatedly after both the Transformers movie and the G.I. Joe movie, also the Final Pony movie, didn't do as well as they had hoped. And they recognized from feedback it was because people went, well, we wanted to see the original characters. We didn't want to see the new characters. Since then, the new characters have become accepted, of course. But a movie based on a TV show is the wrong place to introduce new characters. A movie introducing new characters all on its own, that's fine. Not a movie based on a TV show. But there, I had to write a script that could logically incorporate new characters and work them in. And the way I did that was by simply making the training and recruitment a part of the story. I not only have the regular Joe characters who were brought in, but one of the new characters was a troublemaker. So we sent him off to Sergeant Slaughter to have Sergeant <laughs> Slaughter whip him into shape. And by the way, uh, the Sarge, Bob Remus, is really a cool guy. If, uh, I don't know if, if Rob is back there or not, but if he can get Sarge to come for one of these things, it would, it would be really good. Security yeah. man. Yeah. You know your job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Rob, uh, the Sergeant <laughs> Slaughter was like, he's, he's, he was just a delight to work with. He's, the voice actor you're talking about? Well, he was, he's a professional wrestler. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry. And he, um, but he is a voice actor, and he just, when he, when he puts 
the uniform on, he becomes a Sarge. He's tons of fun, both as a Sarge and as Bob Lewis. Um, I'll, I'll, save, I'll save one of the stories for tomorrow. I'm telling the different kind of stories tomorrow. Let me ask this. Anyone out there have specific questions that they would like regarding animation, either the general approach to writing animation or any specific questions? Oh. All right. Um, I'm a child of the 80s. Okay. Uh, Transformers was my jam back then. Okay. Um, one of the things, and you're talking about how you make things important to a character in a show, and that's one of the things I kind of remember about Transformers was that me and my friend Blake, we would always sit there and we'd go, wow, that was a killer episode because it meant something. Yeah. What was something on Transformers specifically that I might remember that you worked on? How many episodes did you work on or write? Or? I, I am officially on three, and I probably co-wrote up to five. Okay. And there's any number that I might have done a polish on where they just tossed it on my desk and said, can, can you make this scene a little tighter? Yeah. And I would go through and edit it real quick and hand it back. So. My, my position has always been as a staff writer or a story editor, I don't put my name on other people's material. Okay. Uh, as a story editor, on more than one occasion, I've done a page one rewrite, and the original writer's name stayed on it. I didn't add my name at all. What was, what were like one or two that, trans were, that were really kind of yours? Well, uh, one of my favorites, in fact, my favorite particular Transformers episode was uh, The God Gambit because it, yeah. it dealt with something that was important to me. And this is where your question about getting a character, something that's important to the character involved. The plot, for those of you who may not have seen it, involves the um, both sides need uh, a, a form of energy that is not commonly found on Earth. And they detect it on Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. So three of the... Um, Decepticons go to Saturn to, you know, get this material so they can power up and they can defeat the Transformers. And the Transformers, they they can't get to Saturn because they don't have a way of getting there, with the exception they have one that can transform into a shuttle, but it will take all the energy he has to get there. It's going to be a one-way trip. And so you have to find, you know, this, to him it's an important story because you know, he's going on a one on virtually a suicide mission. They can't get any energy to refuel it. So he's taking a very big risk. Um, Jazz was one of the other Autobots that went with them. And when Jazz arrives on Titan, he finds out that the Decepticons have arrived, and there are natives, uh, alien natives living on Titan, who interpret the Decepticons as being the sky gods. And the Decepticons are going, yeah, sure, we're the Sky Gods. Uh, now we want you to get all the energon and bring it to us, because that's what you do. You worship your Sky Gods by bringing all this stuff to us. And Jazz has to convince the natives that, no, 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 these aren't actually bad guys. They're, they're lying to you. They are not gods. But it's kind of hard to argue they're not gods when they're showing up and they're blasting things with lasers and they're doing all sorts of impressive, seemingly godlike stuff. And for Jazz, the drive was not just we've got to keep the Decepticons from getting the source of energy so they, they can fight us, but it was also the, the moral indignation of, you know, it's one thing when you're fighting us because you and I, we have a, a beef with each other. But it's another thing when you lie to somebody and you abuse and oppress somebody else for your benefit in an attempt to harm us. this Our fight has nothing to do with them. They shouldn't be involved in this at all. So that became the working angle for, for the story for me. The jazz was really you know, bothered by the fact that the Decepticons were trying to manipulate this. Um, I like writing the episode. Any time I got a chance to write a Transformers episode, I would always try to write jazz into it. Because if you wrote an episode at Sunbow, you got to go in and sit in on the recording sessions. And believe me, nothing was more fun than Scatman, than Scatman Brothers uh, <laughs> in the recording session. They were just great. So. I was going to say, you probably had to be a fun person to, oh, to know. Oh, it was, it was tremendous. Yeah, he was a wonderful guy. Yeah. 
all of the, all of the voice actors were were interesting, fun people. There was there was never a single problem child, so to speak, among them. Um, we did have, and I'll, this is a sidebar. It doesn't involve me, but I'll just tell the story anyway. We did have Casey Kasem walk off one recording session because, um, as a tongue-in-cheek um, reference, they they uh, created. Um, I'm going to say Karjakistan or something like that, uh, but they, it was, they were making a parody of Muammar Gaddafi and uh, uh, Casey, who was was of you know Arab descent, reads this and he goes, "No, I'm not doing it. I'm not making fun of the Arabs." And he just got up and he walked right out. And uh, um, bravo for him for standing up to it. And of course, everybody else in the recording session is. Well, I can do Casey's voices. <laughs> And so uh, we had somebody uh, do Casey's voice for that episode. Uh, but they would have you in there because sometimes you'd hear a line and it wouldn't work and you would, you would ask to correct it. Um, unfortunately, sometimes they wouldn't correct it. With the G.I. Joe movie, I had written a line, this battle cry, that was supposed to sound like something that came out of the movie Lawrence of Arabia. You've seen was that, that the Cobra? Cobra la 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 yeah. la 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 Oh, God. When, yeah, uh, you should have, that was my reaction the first time I heard it. Um, if you've seen Lawrence of Arabia, there's a scene fairly early in the movie where these Bedouin women act as kind of a living air raid siren, and when they see the Turkish Air Force approaching, they turn and make this incredibly high-pitched, shrill, trilling sound that alerts the rest of the Bedouins that the airplanes are coming. And I thought, if we can do that, it will sound really cool. The problem is Dick Godier, who was cast as Serpentor, had a voice about four octaves too low. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as a result, uh, the first time I hear it go, Cobra, la 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 la. Whoa, stop, stop, stop. No. I said, guys, no, this isn't going to work. Please, give me a chance. Give me a few minutes. I'll come up with a better battle cry. Ah, nah, it's great. We like it. You know. No, 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 please, no. Don't use this. They used it. You know. We had another question over here. I don't remember who it was then. <laughs> you know what? Wait, After wait, that. Wait, wait, wait. wait uh, uh, what were the, what were the, uh, an assignment where the editorial constraints were just insane, the wildest constraints they could possibly put on there? I worked on a show called The Little Clowns of Happy Town. <laughs> And it was put together by, um, there were a group of people who claimed that they could tell you what shows were good and not good for kids. And that they would analyze your shows and tell you what was right and wrong about them. For example, on uh, the Ghostbusters show, they, they said change the secretary's horn-rimmed glasses to round edges because sharp edges frighten children. And, and literally, they had things like, you know, I'm getting, there's a there's a furry back here, you can't see him on camera, but he's throwing his hands up, going. Yeah, you, you, might, you might make it up on a story. Yeah. <laughs> With consent. Of yes. Uh, but in any case, um, and so ABC decided to let these people run a show, and they created a show called The Little Clowns of Happy Town, where, um, the, the restraints were such that one clown could not throw a pie at another clown's face. The clown could put the pie on the ground, and then the second clown could come walking along and trip accidentally and fall face first into the pie. And I worked on the show only because the two ladies who were story editing it were friends of mine and I was, I was trying to help them out. They were having a really tough time. No surprise. Coming up with <laughs> scripts. And honest to goodness, I was working on this thing and I was trying to work in Pennywise references. Well, Uncle Pennywise always said, you know, for those of you who may not be aware, Pennywise is the clown in it. Yeah. Uh, I kept trying to work Pennywise references in, but they intercepted me. They said, Buzz, don't make our life harder, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, so wholesome. Uh, I did get a Mad Max reference in. There was a, a truck that went by, and on the, it was a moving van, and on the side of it was the slogan, no matter where you go, there we are, which was from 
Mad Max uh, um, uh, Road Warrior. Road Warrior. That was the what they kept saying all the way to the Road Warrior. So I thought, well, get this one past it. Needless to say, the show bombed horribly, mm -hmm. and the the people were shown the door, and nobody ever gave them at least any more attention. But every five or six years, there's some brand new group that pops up and claims we we know what's wrong and we can fix the problem. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'll divert for a moment here to tell you about a scheme a friend of mine and I cooked up that we never did, but we were tempted. We used to get Daily Variety, which was like a, a, a newspaper, it's literally a newspaper for the for Hollywood. And typically on Wednesday they would announce TV shows or films in production. And these were announced starting dates. These were before the films had actually been completed. And we came up with this scheme that we would buy about 100 copies of the Daily Variety that had films in production on it. And we would go through and we would rate them A, A plus, B minus, and whatnot, as to how well we thought they would do at the box office. And then we would mail them to ourselves, registered mail, on that day. But we would have some hidden sig code on the, on the envelope to let us know what our answers were in which particular uh, variety that we had marked up. And the idea would be that a year later when these movies had come out and had succeeded or failed at the box office, we would go into the head of the studio and we would hand them the envelope that would have the correct answers in it out of the hundred that we did. And we would say, open that up. He would open it up and he would see how right we were. And we knew we had to be only 85% right. If we were 100% right, he would suspect something. 85% right and go, these guys are pretty sharp. And we would hand it to him and say, hire us to decide what you should or shouldn't put into production. And we talked about it. We actually schemed on it. We thought, eh, nah, that's... That's, you know, because the problem there is you only got about like six months and then it becomes obvious you're a fraud and you get shown the door because that's what happens to everybody else who has a scheme like that. Eventually, you know, they, they get caught and they get shown the door. You were talking about not remembering uh, something. Uh, my, my reaction was it must not have been important and I based that off of the way that Max Senate comedies used to be written. Max Sennett, and this was um, uh, the director, Frank Capra, had originally been a gag writer for Max Sennett, and he wrote about this in his biography. Max Sennett had a floor in his studio that was entirely gag writers, and their job was to come up with stories and gags for his directors to shoot. And they never wrote anything down, or at least they didn't write a script in the formal sense. They might have notes that they would keep, but they would come up with these ideas, and then when they had one, they would bring the director up. And the director would sit down, and they would tell the director the story. The director was not allowed to take any notes. He had to remember everything. And then he would go out, and he would shoot the film. Now, these are like two real films. These are short films, so we're not talking features. He would go out and shoot the movie from memory. And Senate's logic was this. Anything the director forgets wasn't that important to begin with. <laughs> you know, we're still talking about Max Senate, so he must have had something on the ball there. Any other questions that people might have? So, I'm going to still shoot. Okay. So, I've, I've got one to shoot your way, because I'm actually kind of curious, and I'm going to take advantage while I've got it. So, let me run a hypothetical by you. You're, you're writing a show, you're having a good time. It's a pretty successful show, you know, having a good time. You get one of these editorial fiats come down, like the clouds part and these god rays come down. Uh, and they, you know, you get this thing, like you brought up the whole, like, no, they're not lesbians, they're cousins, that kind of thing. What, what in your opinion, would you do if, you know, you, the editors come down, they say, well, we really need you to write an episode about, like, a or whatever, just to use a random thing, and you're like, well, I really kind of believe B. I think A is kind of messed up. Like, how do you how do you resolve that sort of internal conflict? 
Well, that's, that's an excellent question to ask, and I, I have a specific answer. I don't know how many of you may remember a show called Goldie Gold and Action Jack. Ah, good, thank you. Goldie Gold was created in response to Richie Rich. Now, Richie Rich in the comic books is an eight-year-old kid, and the gag of Richie Rich comics is he has so much money, it is physically difficult to deal with. He doesn't have enough space to hold all the money he has. This is the humor that a little kid would get out of money, okay? And for little kids, that works perfectly. Richie Rich comics are great for little kids. The Richie Rich TV show raised his age to 10 made him a little older so he could have a little more choice in his life, decide he wants to do things with the money, but it's still something a 10-year-old kid would do. So the Richie Rich stories on TV, they were fun and amusing too because again, it is from a child's point of view. Goldie Gold is a teenager who is the wealthiest teenager in the world. She has no visible parents. She originally had a uh, older soldier of fortune who was her mentor, who was her bodyguard, who was a variety of things, and she traveled around the world having all these fabulous adventures. <clears throat> and my first reaction to this was, if we have a teenager with a limitless source of money, why isn't she dead from a heroin overdose by episode two? And they said, no, 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 we're not doing that sort of a show, but just yeah, it's family friendly. We don't do that. No, no. And I said, well, where are her parents? Are they dead? No, no, no. Their parents are just around. So she's abandoned. That would even be more reason for a heroin. No, the buzz stops. They can stop like this, okay? Come on. So we're, we're doing this show, and, and somebody else, Steve Gerber, pointed out how creepy it was for her to have a, uh, she was originally 16, and it was like a 30-year-old soldier of fortune bodyguard, and they were supposed to have a romance going on. And he fortunately got them to tweak it so that she was 18, and he was like in his early 20s. That's a little less. That's better. Yeah, it's, it's a little better, yeah. But anyway, we still have the problem of Goldie running around, this fabulously wealthy gal, literally buying her way out of trouble every time she gets into trouble. And it's one thing when Richie Rich is trapped in a situation and his way of solving it is by hiring the biggest drill in the world to come and drill a hole through and free him. That makes sense for a 10-year-old, okay? It's another thing when, when Goldie is trying to do the same thing, because then you come into all kinds of problems. Well, wait a second, how fast did these guys get here? How long does it take them? And how did she make the arrangement? And this, that, you know, it's just, it doesn't work that way. So we're doing the pilot episode, and the uh, woman who was in charge of children's programming at ABC at that time said, yeah, and uh, they're running down an alley, and this homeless guy, uh, lets them hide out in his box with them so they're not captured. And I go, okay, fine. And the lady said, and, and she's friends with him. She knows this guy. They're friends. I go, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Goldie is friends with a homeless guy. She said, yeah, she's friends with everybody. She's got friends all around the world. I said, no, no, I don't, I don't object to her knowing him. Why is he living in a box in an alley? What kind of a friend is she if she has somebody living in a box in an alley? Can't she afford a room for him somewhere, you know? No, 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 it's a lifestyle choice. <laughs> <laughs> Which is on par, we, we briefly were developing Bazooka Joe Bubblegum as a cartoon at, at Ruby Spears. And I asked the same lady the same question about Bazooka Joe uh, himself, because Bazooka Joe wears an eye patch. And I said, well, you know, we can actually do a story that explains why you don't play with sticks, because we literally put his eye out with it, and, you know, moms can say, see, I told you. And the lady said, no, 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 it's a fashion state. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this, this explains why I, I didn't get hired at ABC very much after that. <laughs> Other than to be the bad example, yeah. Um, yeah, you get things like that, and uh, if you can dance around them, 
if if it's something that you really find morally objectionable uh, and you can just downplay it, we had characters in G.I. Joe who uh, had points of view, even heroic characters. Uh, Lowlight, for instance. Uh, and for those of you who may be familiar, Lowlight was our sniper character, and he is a really terrible, bas bad, nasty human being. Okay, he's just an awful person. And we actually managed to do a show that kind of explained why he is this bad, awful person. And you have a little bit of empathy for him, but he's still a bad, nasty, awful person. And, you know, you, you have to hold him back. You know, they can say, well, why don't you have him do this? And, yeah, we, we want people to actually like this character. I mean, we want him to buy the toy. You know, we don't want him to come into the store and just, you know, tear the toy up and destroy it without purchasing it. Uh, so let's not have him do the really, really bad things. Let's give him a reason not to do the really, really bad things. Uh, conversely, we would have characters that would be espousing something that I might personally find a little distasteful um, as, as long as it didn't cross a moral line or an ethical line. I might go with it. You know, we might have somebody in, in uh, we might have somebody engaged in some kind of daredevil sports that I think is you know, foolish to get engaged in, but as, well, they're wearing head pads, okay, fine. <laughs> Go ahead, jump through that flaming hoop. You know. um, that's, you, you have to approach it, and at a certain point, you, you, um, you throw down the gauntlet. I, I had a reputation of throwing the gauntlet down. I, I once accused uh, the network, of, uh, told them to their face, you would put gladiatorial combat on television if you thought it would get the ratings. Don't give me this crap about you know you being concerned about you know the kids that are watching it. We would never do something like that. And then the very next season they put they brought uh, uh, at, uh, wrestling back to primetime television. Mm -hmm. So yeah, tell me you wouldn't put gladiatorial combat. Okay. Is, was there ever a character that you didn't like that you had to write for? Oh, well, tons of them. Because <laughs> <laughs> you had to like make that. You um, know. There were there were characters where you just have to grit your teeth and, and plunge through. Um, I worked on um, the Mork and Mindy animated show, and yeah. for reasons known only to Joe Ruby, we had a uh, animated sidekick, a, an alien sidekick that we were not allowed to do anything really alien with. And it was like, it's, we, we have got, forgive me, a big furry blue um, <laughs> ball and chain handcuffed to Mork. <laughs> Sorry, no, nothing personal, nothing personal. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we, we had this character uh, figuratively attached to Mork. And it's like, we just cut him loose and we let Mork be Mork. Yeah. There's another example. I'll tell this story really fast, and we'll let this one be the wrap-up. Sure. Um, there was a period where mm -hmm. Hanna-Barbera sold three different um, Happy Days-based shows in animation. There was um, Happy Days in Outer Space, Laverne and Shirley in the Army, and an animated version of Mork and Mindy. The animated version of Mork and Mindy should have been easy peasy. Just, yeah. just record Robin Williams for an hour and then we'll edit it in wherever we can fit it. You know, <laughs> which is pretty much what they did with uh, Aladdin. I was going to say, they gave a lot of junk yeah, you know. for this um, Anyway, they, they um, made us write scripts for this. And I'm going to spare a lot of the back and forth that went on during the script writing stage. <laughs> but Robin Williams was contractually obliged to supply the voice for Mork based on the Mork and Mindy TV show. There's the contract he signed to do Mork and Mindy said if there are any subsidiary spin-offs, you have to play the character. So he's stuck doing the voice of Mork. And he reads the first script and he told Joe Ruby, I'm going to do all of these in my house in one recording. You send me the scripts when they're ready. I'll record them myself. I'll send you the tape. I'm not having anything else to do with this. And he literally recorded the show flat on his back in his bedroom into a cassette recorder. Just read his lines <coughs> and sent them in, and that was it. 
he, he met the absolute bare minimum requirements of his contract and he couldn't force him to do anything else. And if you've seen the show and you said, wow, he, signed, he sounds really lackluster, there's your explanation. So, with that, thank you all very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the show.